part of this, uh, in the last part of the lecture in the previous video, we discussed about biosafety and we defined some terms, biosecurity, biorisk, biorisk management, even biodefense and bioterrorism. So in this, uh, in this video, we will be discussing about uh, biorisk management, in particular the AMP model. So first, what is um, biorisk management? Again, biorisk management is a system or process to control the safety and security risk associated with the handling or storage and disposal of biological agents and toxins in laboratories and facilities. So this is defined in um, Sen Workshop Agreement uh, Convention. This is way back to 2011. So uh, biorisk management, specifically the AMP model of biorisk management, uh, has three basic components, assessment, mitigation, and performance. So that's why it's called AMP. So assessment, mitigation, and for performance. Now, um, let's discuss each one one by one. So uh, assessment, or specifically risk assessment. So uh, before we continue, we, uh, let's first dis define or differentiate what is risk, what is hazard, and what is a threat. So let's define first the, first, the last two. Hazard. We already, although we discussed it a while ago, or rather in the previous video, hazard is an agent that has a potential to do harm. And a threat is an agent that has the intent to do harm. So again, hazard versus threat, there is an intent in the threat. And a risk is a probability. So it's the likelihood that an adverse event involving a specific hazard or threat will occur and the consequence of that occurrence. So every time in when we are doing a risk assessment, we are always thinking about the risk and we want to mitigate. We want to lessen the risk of the uh, unwanted, uh, unwanted occurrence of the hazard or the threat. So the risk is a function of a likelihood and the consequences. So how likely is the hazard or the threat to occur and what is the consequence of that hazard or threat to us and to the environment? So let's look at this uh, risk assessment matrix. So basically, um, we are here looking at the severity, which is uh, the function, of course, likelihood and the consequences. So we have here... Uh, four scenarios that you can say. So we have a low probability with a high impact. So that means you have a low uh, likelihood that the situation is unlikely to occur, but the consequences are dire. So this is, um, well, we can say uh, it's like uh, if you are, say, uh, if you have um, played uh, games like, say, Super Mario. So remember, uh, Mario is... Uh, jumping around um, ravines and even some um, hazards along the way. So, uh, a low probability and a high impact is that uh, the, the threat or the hazard, so falling down is unlikely to occur here, in the first one, upper left, but you have your, uh, the impact is very high. So, if you do fall down, it is quite severe or the threat is, uh, say, it can be deadly. So that's a low probability but high impact risk. For a low probability with a low impact risk, that is you have you are unlikely to unlikely to fall down or you are unlikely to um or you can actually jump freely, you are unlikely to the event is unlikely to happen. And if it does happen, the consequences are not that severe. So even if you do fall down, it's okay, it's just a shallow uh it's just shallow water, shallow stream, so it's okay. Uh, you will survive. So there's a low probability and low impact. So basically, that's considered a low risk. And then you have a high probability but a low impact. When, I when we talk about high probability, so you are very likely, the threat or the hazard is very likely to occur, but the impact of the threat, the consequences is not so dire. So it's livable, you can survive. It's not that um, you are not, uh, it is not, as deadly as you think so it's a high probability but a low impact still there's a this considered a medium risk and then the high risk is of course high probability and a high impact 
the, the hazard or the threat is highly likely to occur and if it does occur, it is deadly. So that's the high probability high impact threat. So when we are doing risk assessment uh, or assessment of the risk exposure, so we are we need to consider how likely is the event occur and what is the impact if it does occur. So is it dire? Is the um is the uh is the probability? Let's say for example COVID. Uh, COVID is uh for for humans it is a more of a high probability because it's easy to spread. That's actually one of the main problems with COVID. It's easy to spread, and the impact is for uh for the non vulnerables it's mostly uh, not uh you can live. It is um, survivable. It's a survivable disease. But for the vulnerable, it has a high impact. So you can say it's more of in a, a medium to high risk. Actually, it depends on uh, your assessment of who are the ones that will be impacted. Okay? So that is uh, for COVID. Let's have another example about Ebola. Ebola is spread by um, when you are exposed to contaminated blood and fluids so it has uh, of course you need uh, specifically the blood so you need to um, it is not that high probability unless the, the patient is bleeding in front of you and you are not uh, wearing basically any any um, personal protective equipment of course the probability is high but for example for doctors uh, the probability is pretty much low but the impact is high because uh, for Ebola the uh the survival rate is just ten percent. That means the mortality is about ninety percent. Ninety percent of people die when infected by Ebola. So basically, that's quite considered a low probability but a high impact. So that those are the things you consider in uh, risk assessment. So uh, how do you uh, characterize the risk? So we, we, sh- we sh- usually follow an assessment process. So first, we need to define the situation. So what is the hazard? So let's say, for example, in Ebola, the hazard is the Ebola virus. Who is the host? Hosts are humans and even some species, mammal, mammalian species. And how? So how is it transmitted? In the laboratory, for example, if uh, if you are going to do Ebola research, what is um, possible modes of transmission? How can you be infected uh, in the laboratory by Ebola? So that's the situation, and then we define the risk. So we use this uh, risk assessment exposure. Is it a high probability, high impact risk? Is it a low probability, high impact risk, etc. And then uh, characterize the risk. So uh, is it uh, the hazard likelihood? Are you likely to uh, get uh, to get infected? What is the consequence of being infected? Uh, as the host, uh, what is the likelihood that um, you will become the host and then you will infect others. So basically, uh, host likelihood or host consequence or even in the laboratory. What is the likelihood that the Ebola virus will escape the laboratory and spread outside? And what is the consequence if that happens? So you will then determine if is the risk acceptable or not. In characterizing the risk also, you need to consider the facilities that you have currently or the facilities that you will erect or you will uh, develop to uh, actually um, to to do or for example in doing the research what are the um, uh, capabilities of the laboratory that will be using that so that's uh, characterization and then uh, that's for assessment and the next part is uh, mitigation so in virus mitigation these are measures or uh, uh, virus mitigation measures are actions and control measures based on a robust laboratory risk assessment that are put into place to reduce or eliminate the risk associated with biological agents and toxins so for example so you already assess the risk so you say that uh, with the current state of the laboratory that we have uh, doing Ebola research is a high risk, high probability because we do not have um, the proper um, biosafety, lab, uh, biosafety cabinets, etc. And the high, uh, high consequences, high impact, high probability. So, but you still wanted to do the research on Ebola. So you will then um, create uh, procedures and actions as well as even... Um, what are you going to do to lessen the probability or even lessen the impact? So, um, 
in lessening the impact of the threat, of course, you need to consider do we have uh, the vaccine or do we have the uh, the therapeutics or do we have the cure for that? Now, if you don't uh, look at the prevention of the probability, so we need to lessen the probability of the, the the virus to spread to the host to us so that's uh, the mitigation part so what are the things that we should do so for, we can say that we can uh, do ppe etc etc actually we have here hierarchy of controls so which is the most effective and the least versus the least effective to uh, to mitigate the risk to us now of course, the most effective one is elimination. The safest way to study Ebola is not study, or rather not handle the Ebola itself. So physically remove the hazard. So you can study it computationally if you really want to study Ebola. So why not just use computational techniques? So you are not exposed to the hazard at all. Or substitution. Let's say replace the hazard with a similar virus, but it is not infectious to you. So it uh, the, this one uh, is... Uh, actually, the 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 consequences or the, the 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 hard thing about this one is, or the difficulty in this one is that, uh, it's hard to find a substitute. But usually we do substitution. What um, uh, the the substitute must uh, contain the same characteristics or similar characteristics as the actual hazard, but uh, it is the impact is lower to yourself. So that's with substitution. And then the engineering control. Engineering controls, as administrative controls and PPE, these are the ones that we usually use in uh, laboratories. And you can say this is the effectivity is medium to, to uh, little effectivity. So uh, the engineering controls, so we need to isolate people from the hazard. So when we talk about engineering controls, these are the infrastructures. So we use uh, biosafety laboratories. Uh, we have uh, biosafety cabinets. We... Uh, we design a laboratory that uh, can isolate people from the hazard. Administrative controls, we design protocols and SOPs to change uh, how this hazard can be handled. And finally, the least effective one is the use of the PPE. These are the personal protective equipment that protects the actual worker with the, um, from being exposed. To the hazard and it's considered the least effective because despite wearing PPE of course uh, there's wear and tear there are some um, sometimes what if you accidentally touch your face it's actually the one of the leading causes of infection in the wor the workers the laboratory and health workers is that they touch their, their faces because for example if you are wearing glasses so uh, especially for people who wear glasses you tend to touch your face you touch your face to adjust your glasses to adjust your mask and your hands has the virus of course your you will be exposed so that's the problem with the ppes so pp study is effective but still we need those personal protective equipment so it's actually better than nothing so that's for mitigation. And the last um, last leg of the AMP model is the performance. Performance management is a systematic process intended to achieve improved levels of organizational objectives and goals. Basically, you are going to check the performance of the, the assessment that we did and the mitigation practice that we have. So uh, this one is... Um, uh, it provides uh, direct evidence that an organization can substantively understand and effectively reduce its operational risk to an acceptable level. You are going to assess how well are your mitigation controls to the hazard, is, or rather, basically, is your procedures, is your mitigation uh, measures working? Are, you being, uh, are, are there infections occurring in your laboratory? Is your hazard released to the outside world? So basically, this is the performance part. You are checking if you, what you are doing, your mitigation controls are actually working. So uh, in this AMP cycle, or we, or rather this is the performance, in checking the performance, we can uh, go to the PCDA cycle. So PCDA, the first we need to plan. Plan a, plan a change and develop goals. So where are you? Specifically in the laboratory setting. A laboratory is basically an organization. You have a head, you have a director, and you have uh, people under that director that do the work. So what is uh, what is the goal of your organization? Where are you in your goals? Where do you want your goals to be? So for example, um, you want to be uh, uh, a big... Uh, 
your goal is to become uh, a research center, a Philippine research center. So what, where are you right now and um, where do you want to be? And then establish the objectives and processes to meet your targets and goals. So the next one is to do. So implement your plan, execute the process, and test the change. And then when you do the activity, you check it. Do you actually uh, get the results? Are you actually going towards your goal? Are there any progress? So study the actual results and compare them against expected results. Review the test, analyze the results, and identify what has been learned. Measure the performance of your um, laboratory laboratory performance. Are you actually uh, doing substantive research? Or, or is it safe, etc.? And then assess how the risks are being controlled and if uh, and if aims are being achieved. And then we need to act. So if there is a problems, you do corrective measures. Request corrective actions to address differences between actual and planned results. Analyze differences to determine the causes. Take action based on what has been learned. And use what has been learned to plan new improvements beginning the cycle again. So basically, act is reviewing the performance and taking actions on the lessons learned on your performance. For example, um, there is an outbreak of uh, one of your workers has accidentally been infected by an, by the virus in your laboratory. So what you should do and what uh, you need to, of course, assess why why how is it how has it happened. Is it a problem of the worker? Is it a problem of the operations? And then introduce uh, corrective measures to prevent that, that from happening again. And then take action. Okay, so that's it for uh, the M- AMP model. So uh, this that's it for this uh, part of the lecture. So you can look at the Blackboard for uh, your assessment questions.